Hello and welcome to Court Games, a Legend of the Five Rings podcast funded by the Legend of the Five Rings Discord Patreon community. This podcast will focus on the role-playing game, stories, and lore for Legend of the Five Rings. I'm Korva. And I'm Kakita Kaori. Today we're going to talk about the history of RPGs and specifically about Legend of the Five Rings as it fits into that Once it gets started, we'll talk a little bit about how the game developed and the different versions and so on. It might be useful for people who are relatively new to the game, especially the ones who've picked up FFG's edition, because there is like 25 years of previous storyline and history and stuff, and some of us old folk do go on about it. (laughs) We do, we do, we're terrible. (laughs) So it might be an idea to kind of... This might help to, to get an idea of how it all fits in to the grand scheme of things. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So if we want to start right back at the beginning, there was a, a very strong kind of wargaming community in America and various other places. But that eventually became what we now know of as Dungeons and Dragons, which was Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson taking their wargaming roots into role playing so you can you can see a lot of that ancestry in dungeons and dragons so that was first released in 1974 that's when role playing games really really start and uh, so it was taken very much from the wargame with miniatures and stuff and so you, you can you can see that still today <laughs> right so for centuries Folks have been sitting around with little tin soldiers playing battle games. So that's the tradition out of which Dungeons and Dragons came rather than, you know, the role playing side was, well, we've also sat around and told stories with each other, but that was, it was the role playing side that was new, not the miniatures and and maps and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the very first one. There were many role playing games of different kinds sold between 1974 and 1981. These were mostly sold at gaming stores, at specific stores, and they weren't in regular bookstores or toy stores or anything like that. And this was before the internet. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, you didn't have a way of finding out about them. If you lived in a little college town in the Midwest, there would be, you know, groups that would associate with and some of them might start a gaming store to support this hobby. But if you were outside of this very specific niche of community, you would have no way of hearing about um, any any role playing games. Different groups of people would learn about them through trade magazines, but there was not no internet to order them or anything like that. You just had to spread word as you traveled or or through these trade magazines. There were like, like magazines and mailing lists and things like that, but it was very difficult to just stumble across this if you didn't already know it existed. Mm-hmm. That started changing in 1981. At the time, TSR began selling its product in toy stores, like Toys R Us. Any other products except Dungeons & Dragons were not sold in, in Toys R Us. It was this one company making a, a push to try and get uh, role-playing games out to kids as a kid's product. The simultaneous push, because this was what was done at the time. If you had a, market, uh, a toy you wanted to market, you made a cartoon about that product. Yeah. And so, I mean, like Transformers and G.I. Joe, all these toys, in order to market it to more kids, they would make a cartoon TV series for that product. And so in 1981, they made the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. And that, along with having them for sale in uh, toy stores, is what brought Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games in general to a much broader audience. But this broader audience were not creating their own games. These are all kids 
fighting toys at toy stores playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah. So other games other than D&D were still in these little enclaves. Speaking of other games and enclaves, in 1981, a game comes out called Bushido, which is, I don't know if it's the absolute first Japanese-based role-playing game. It's the first I could find in English. Yes, I think it first came out in 1980, but the main but is mainly out in 1981. Um, I believe there's something called the, the Land of the Rising Sun, which is another small system in about the same time. And this was an attempt to do a Japanese historical game with magic and monsters. So this was very much based off the war games. If you, I've I've read Bushido, I've actually played it. And the rules are absolutely wargaming rules. They really, really are. And they've got sections and subsections and subparagraphs and tables and all sorts. So they focus very much on being like a simulationist, realist kind of thing. Um, only, again, they're adding magic and monsters. So the roles of women was very traditional, at least very traditional for Edo slash Sengoku Jedi. Uh, you rolled your social cast randomly, which must have made for some interesting groups. <laughs> How do we put these people together? Right. But the whole focus was realism, as I understand it, right? Yes, or at least their view of it. Quote, unquote, realistic. Their view of realistic as possible. Realism and simulationist. And I actually think this might be the first use of the word shugenja as a gaming term for a character class, basically. In Bushido, a Shigenja is a mountain ascetic who comes down from the mountains with various powers. That's kind of the role that they hold, which is not dissimilar to the people who actually practice Shigendo and were known often as Shigenja, but also as Yamabushi, and you see them very often in very specific priestly robes with the kind of pom-poms on the chest. Uh, you will occasionally see Tengu dressed up like that. And I think this might be where the Legend of the Five Rings usage of the word Shigenja originally comes from. It's definitely sure that uh, Legend of the Five Rings did draw considerable inspiration from Bushido in, in terms of how it, how it came out. That was in 1981, and but again, as a non-Dungeons & Dragons game, it was kind of in these niche uh, markets still. Absolutely. So Dungeons & Dragons itself as a product grew between 1981 to 1985. And 1985, Dungeons & Dragons came out with two products together that were very big, and they were Oriental Adventures and Unearthed Arcana. And they were released like within three months of each other. I think Oriental Adventures was a little bit first. And the point of those was to try and inspire people to buy more Dungeons & Dragons products, not just the core game, which is what there was before, and the Dungeon Master's Guide and stuff for the GM, but to get the players, not Dungeon Masters, to have more books. And there's always been this thing in gaming where if you want to sell more books, you got to have more more schools, more classes. Yep. I remember when Oriental Adventures came out. I mean, it was an attempt to kind of redo, is almost its own player's handbook in a way mm -hmm. because you were supposed to, you know, instead of instead of playing the fighter, you'd play a samurai or a bushi. Instead of playing a magic user, you'd play a wujen and all that, and all that sort of thing. And Anata Kana, meanwhile, was here's a whole bunch of new rules and new character classes and a whole new stat. For classic D&D. Yes, for classic uh, for classic D&D. So if Bushido was simulationist in terms of its RPG origins and trying Oriental Adventures to me was very much wedded to Dungeons and Dragons. Absolutely. It was much more fantastical. It did not care for anything at all like historical realism. It didn't even try because that wasn't the point. It wasn't basing it on history. It was basing it on movies. Uh, and at this time, the Japanese movies, Asian movies in general, to be honest, were all very cheesy action flick stuff. Yeah, the, the, the cheap stuff that you could get quickly and easily and then sell to people who didn't necessarily understand what was going on, but 
they could see the action. But like to see fighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like to see kung fu fighting. So that, I mean, when you grew up in the 80s, that was what was on, you know, Sunday afternoon. Mm. It didn't try to, to research anything. It, it just didn't. Its its goal was to make a bunch of characters that could be slotted into regular Dungeons & Dragons. And this was along the lines of what Dungeons & Dragons was. Nobody cared if their paladin had anything to do with people who were in the real world called paladins, you know, or cavaliers. It had nothing to do with France. It was just the way it was at the time. And Oriental Adventures and Unearthed Arcana shared a bunch of new mechanics like comeliness and stuff that they were just kind of trying out to stick them out there anyway. Yeah. And Oriental Adventures did have its own background, which was Karatur. But as you say, you, you just as easily pick those character classes and chuck them into a standard D&D game if you wanted. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like the Karatur was created to be like you could have your D&D &D characters go there too, to have the, their Asian-esque adventure it, it it wasn't any deeper than if it was as deep as water deep or forgotten realms that would be it wasn't intended to be any deep it was in the back of the book as opposed to its own supplement so you, you can kind of get an idea of how detailed the whole thing was um i can't even remember much about it so things started to change in 1985 in terms of D and and its access at that time the satanic panic hit in the U.S. And this was a very weird cultural phenomenon where uh, a lot of people started believing that there were tons of Satan worshippers out there doing terrible things to children. Yeah. And we, I mean, we have people being arrested and jailed for many, many months and years for this stuff. All right. I mean, this is bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, for stuff that, that was literally impossible. And, you know, the, the, right. it was it was all sorts of weirdness. Like, you know, they took us into the tunnels underneath the school. There were no tunnels underneath the school. And all sorts of weird stuff. And, and people were, oh, it was, it was just craziness. It was very strange watching the news from our side of the pond, I have to say. <laughs> I, was a, I was a little young to understand what was going on. And my parents did not buy that sort of junk. But a lot of parents did. Yeah, yeah. Dungeons and Dragons took a lot of blame, okay, for this rise of Satanism. And there were books published linking Dungeons and Dragons to this rise of Satanism and all this weird stuff. And because of that, Dungeons and Dragons became not acceptable to give to small children. And it was pulled off all those toy store shelves. Remember, this wasn't really so much in bookstores. It was in toy stores. And it went back to the specialized game shops. And it stayed in those specialized game stops for the next six years. Yeah, which is a long time in role-playing game history. <laughs> right. Until 1991 or so. At that point, the panic had died out and it was okay for Dungeons & Dragons to come back. And a new game had taken hold, which was Magic the Gathering. Now, you see, you see if you're in a moral panic, Magic the Gathering is where you want your moral panic yeah, but that makes money, so... That's, well, exactly. <laughs> it's too lucrative to panic about. Uh, it was very lucrative. Magic the Gathering was very lucrative and very popular. And it had this fantasy element, too. And so it came out, and then it kind of brought with it everything, all, all the gaming stuff that was from the gaming stores, Dungeons and Dragons back, not in the toy stores anymore, back in bookstores. Magic the Gathering started up game stores in many more places because now you had a lucrative product you could build your game store around, right? And it was bringing kids in to the game stores who never would have gone into the game stores and they started to get exposed to role-playing games because the shops, all the pretty much all the role-playing game shops started turning into card shops. I remember at the time thinking that this could literally be the end of role-playing games because almost everything was getting replaced by card shops. But in the end, having the kids in there and getting into Magic the Gathering, that's when a lot of them got exposed to D&D &D and other role-playing games, which otherwise they may not have done. Mm -hmm. And so this was kind of around 1991. And the thing that really was driving this Magic the Gathering and spreading new game systems and new game stops is that the internet was starting. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Starting to be accessible to many more people than it had ever been before. It didn't look like the internet today. No, right? no. At all. It had a lot of message boards, though. And yeah. so it would allow people to communicate with each other about Dungeons & Dragons, about role-playing games, and about non-Dungeons & Dragons role-playing games. And so this made things be able to spike in popularity, even if you didn't subscribe to the magazines. And, and as things got more popular, then bookstores... Like we could stock that and we could sell it. Yeah. And so you started to get the very first non Dungeons and Dragons games to hit normal bookstores at that point. So that was the first one that I remember was Vampire the Masquerade by White Wolf. You can't underestimate the impact that Vampire the Masquerade had on the gaming community because that was another thing that brought in people who had never been in the gaming community at all. And yeah, I think the original yes, internet, the, <laughs> the goth, yeah, the goths. I mean, that was it was quite significant. It was, and you know, they they would never have hung out with us, you know, nerdy geeks, until they discovered they are themselves nerdy geeks in their own way. <laughs> right. So, so being a nerdy geek, playing these games was more socially acceptable. Starting at that point, it is around that time in 1995. We've got Vampire the Masquerade steaming along. We've got Magic the Gathering has been out for a couple years. The group of kids who had seen Dungeons and Dragons cartoons as a kid were now spending their own money. They were now in college and building the bulk of this community. So you just had this demand that panic had kind of suppressed for a while. Yeah. And it was into this environment that Legend of the Five Rings was created. And it was absolutely created because Magic the Gathering was so successful and so popular that competitors could just pour into that market trying to rake in some of that sweet magic money. I mean, that was there were so many card games then. It was basically a license to print money in the very, very early stages. Pretty much anybody could make any card game and make money off of it. It was a, it was a crazy time. There was the D&D one, there was a Vampire the Masquerade one. Pretty much every role-playing game came out with its own. There are so many. I mean, some of them are still pretty much... I mean, you got Yugo and Pokemon as well. That's I think believe they got their starts around about that same time. Yeah, they were a little bit later, and they started in Japan, but they were made in Japan as a reaction to this trend going on in the U.S. Yes, <laughs> and then they they came over from Japan, so that took a little while. They showed up in the U.S. a little bit later. Mm. But L five R, so L five R came out in 1995, and it had really good success. People liked the Japanese theme specifically, and they liked it because it had a mythos that started around it that the players should shape the story. And it had this built in from the beginning. It was not originally created to last 25 years, okay? It was supposed to be two years of tournaments ending with a gigantic grand tournament about who would defeat... Fulang, who would defeat the ultimate evil. So the clans are fighting against each other in the face of ultimate evil. And then at the very end of two years, either ultimate evil will win or one of the clans will win, defeat the ultimate evil and defeat, you know, become the emperor. And people really got into this idea that they could shape the story. The other card games didn't have much of a story. Magic added it but it didn't have it really at that time. It had little hints of a story, but not like amount you could make a book on it kind of story, not back then. I mean, fundamentally, you could impact the official story by your deck choices, let alone winning a tournament and actually getting to select a prize. If your playing style caught the eye of one of the makers of Legend of the Five Rings you could end up actually changing the story. And a lot of legends have come up during this time. They had a magazine called the Imperial Herald that was coming out at the same time as this to kind of branch. As we said, all of these things had trade magazines. That was pre-internet. That was how you talked about it. They had a trade magazine for Legend of the Five Rings and a club that you could pay and join 
and and you would get this magazine. And in their first magazine, they had a vote. And the vote was which clan champion would betray the clan and the empire. And they had a bunch of different choices. And it ended up that the first vote, Doji Hattori won the vote. And therefore, the false story storyline was a, a result of that vote. Yeah, so you can you, you can see the you know, people had the had the huge impact on what happened. Right. So you didn't even have to win. You could you could join and and do votes. There were stories people could share, and and this was very exciting to people. And as I said, L five R when it was originally constructed was created to cover two years, right? And with the Day of Thunder, big tournament to defeat evil. Yeah. It was so popular at that point. And what he had done was so unique that they didn't want to stop, even though they said that they were going to stop. <laughs> we'll have a link in our show notes called The Greatest Story in Gaming, uh, where Matt Colville tells the story of the tournament where that Day of Thunder happened. It's got a little few in the inaccuracies from being too old and knowing about some of it, but mostly he gets it right. <laughs> I think he's a, he's a very good storyteller, so so we'll definitely give you a link to that. It has already passed into legend. It's passed into legend, yes. The role-playing game for Legend of the Five Rings came out in 1997 with first edition L5R. The role-playing game emphasized a balance between courtly stakes and combat, which I, I've written about on my blog. That was pretty new. Yeah, yeah. The combat was extremely lethal. And the roll and keep, where you roll a bunch of D10s and you can keep some of them to hit your totals, and then making raises to voluntarily raise your target number to hit for additional goodness, allowed for continuously raising the stakes on combat and social stuff. And, and so this was a, a really good mechanic for... Not only the vampire masquerade, how do I beat you and stab you in the back <laughs> better than you would stab me in the back, or the D&D, how do I stab you literally with a sword <laughs> versus you stabbing me. This allows a gamified, you know, courtly, courtly stakes. Yeah. And, and simply by having mechanics for courtly behavior and for social things like that, you are essentially saying this is an important part of the game. Mm -hmm. So just just by doing that, you're signaling that this is a slightly different kind of setup. Now, in 1997, Legend of the Five Rings was acquired by Wizards of the Coast, who were the people behind Magic the Gathering and who had bought Dungeons of Dragons. And so they were now publishing the Legend of the Five Rings card game and the role-playing game. Things just mainly continued as they were. In 2001, however... Wizards of the Coast republished Oriental Adventures. And instead of using the original character background, which was created for the first Oriental Adventures, they used Rokugan as their setting. And they essentially created a D20 version of Legend of the Five Rings. So the second edition of Legend of the Five Rings was essentially published alongside the D&D &D version of the stat. So there's the dual stat supplements, which was a thing for a while. So this brought Rock Again and Legend of the Five Rings into an even broader world, because now instead of just being for the Legend of the Five Rings role-playing group and the card gamers, that was now the standard Asian setting for Dungeons & Dragons for quite some time. So that was, a, that was a big change in popularity. Yeah. So I've met a lot of people who were introduced to L5R through <laughs> this Oriental Adventures second edition thing. They didn't go all the way to D20 because Roll and Keep was so persuasive. Yeah, yeah. You really, you know, if you asked one thing, don't take Roll and Keep from Michael, <laughs> <laughs> you know, from me. I won't give it up. No. Because of how it emphasizes and puts this little gambling aspect, or it, it, it really gamifies skill rolls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, combat in a way that D20 can't because of how it works. 
Yeah. People who were coming into Orient's adventures were getting both when they started digging into it, and then they kind of switched and became full-on L5R fans. Towards the end of 2001, at this point, Wizards of the Coast, it had Dungeons of Dragons, it had Magic the Gathering. This was, like, really a hot property. Yeah, okay? yeah, absolutely. That year, it got sold to Hasbro, which is the big board game store, like the biggest toy store at that time in the United States, anyway. There was a lot of doubt at that time, that Hasbro would respect Legend of the Five Rings. They thought that Hasbro would just strip this little tail end of system and either go full in and put it in with Oriental Adventures or just run L5R as a separate entity into the ground. Yeah, It was, it was a lot of concern. A lot of players were very, very upset that this was happening. But Hasbro truly didn't care about L5R. So it just was a very small thing to them. Yeah. So at that point, a number of companies bid to try to get L5R out from under Hasbro and, and buy that property back. And after the bidding war, AEG, where it originally started with, won the war, won the bidding war. And that brought L5R back to just AEG. With Wizard of the Coast no longer creating Oriental Ventures because <laughs> everything was stopping then. There was a reason for the concern. That being sold, AEG acquiring the property, at that point, they were free to make a third edition of L5R uh, in 2005 that didn't have the D20 stats or the other things linked to Oriental Ventures that was just purely independent. I don't know about you. I thought... Third edition was not the best balanced product ever. All the tales of the people who ran third edition campaigns is that it seemed to be a lot of fun, but it was not balanced and things got crazy. Like, you, yeah, the people, you know, you, you get Miramotos with like five attacks around or whatever and crab who are completely unkillable and lions who could not be hit or whatever it was. I, there are we, there are many, many t tales of extremely broken character builds so it kind of got run into the ground there a lot of issues with third edition so still under aeg they came out with a fourth edition uh in 2010 and fourth edition if you are looking at old 5r pre the sale to ffg uh is considered like the most balanced yep. rule set it's been play tested at that point almost 20 years in one format or another it had been been play tested well at that point for 15 years it's it'd been in various incarnations for a long time so they could start really seeing what worked and what didn't and addressing it yeah so i liked fourth edition i think i thought it was pretty balanced overall me too uh, it worked very well um I, I had more fun with it it didn't have the lethality no oh well, unless you used optional optional rules yeah <laughs> Um, I came in right at the end of third, and but mo most of my gaming with Legend of Five Rings has been fourth, so that's what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. I skipped a lot of. Um, well, I have all of them, but I did not play in third edition, and I did not play in most of second edition. They kind of had a, a 1.5 or something. They made some changes in one that like started really screwing things up for all the kinds of characters I wanted to build. Oh dear. Okay, I'll admit it. They made Kakita unable to do anything outside of duels, and it was that way for a very long time. So you had that way till fourth, yeah. It was. And fourth, you can play one again. It took some work, but, you know, and I was just like, this isn't, this is no fun. Mm. So, I'm bad, I know. Um, <laughs> so in 2015, AEG was facing a market with seriously declining revenues. The, the card game, it had survived a lot. Yeah. In terms of the card game market. But the card game market was dying off. Um, Magic the Gathering was beginning to uh, pick back up again after a long lag. But there wasn't that much room in the market for a lot of other game systems. And the hot new thing was living card games. 
and AAG was trying desperately to figure out how to pump up their sales of their card game. And it had been, generally speaking, you know, kind of stacked game with game with the same basic rules since the beginning. There had been structural changes, but the essence was still there all the way along. And AEG was trying to shake it up so they could start sales again. And the new hotness was a living card game. So they were planning on basically taking the product and trying to turn it or rebuild it themselves as a living card game. And a living card game means that instead of buying collectible packs and hoping that you get the cards you want in those packs, you get every card when you buy a pack. Yeah. You don't have to fish. But it also means that it's kind of expensive to get in because you don't have as much trading going on, which is what a big part of a collectibles card games was. When that happened, and this was a real surprise, they got together and Steve Horvath, which who was an old time Legend of the Five Rings player for many years, was running Fantasy Flight games. And there was an offer made and accepted to purchase L5R by Fantasy Flight Games, kind of all in a all in a weekend. Wow. Fantasy Flight specialized in living card games. So it seemed like a natural fit for AG and AG kind of wanted to go over into their other popular products that weren't collectible card games, which have a lot of rule testing and overhead. And L5R is not an easy game to balance. No other game, I think, has people caring so much what faction. Absolutely. <laughs> you, 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 you don't get the, in Magic the Gathering, they've got the five magic types. You don't have people saying, you know, white magic forever, no, no red, only red, or anything <laughs> like that. You don't, you don't quite get that same... Uh, identification. Sports team. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's very hard to balance L5R. It is, yeah. I mean, it, maybe you get it a bit with things like Warhammer, where there are people saying, no, only orcs. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very specific to L5R, yeah. Mm -hmm. So FFG took it up in 2015, and then it was silent <laughs> for two years. Yeah. As they worked on creating and playtesting a new version of the card game as a living card game. And so that was released in 2017. And then a new version of the role-playing game, which we call 5th edition, but it's FFG's first edition, with extremely different rules. Very much so. Came out in uh, 2018. And so that kind of brings us to now, where uh, FFG... Very shortly after it came out, it was bought by um, Asmodee, which is a French game entity. Yeah. And then the role-playing game is being shifted to Edge Studios, and the LCG has just kind of wrapped up. Yeah. So that kind of tells you where you are. At this point, the internet, you can find any kind of role-playing game anywhere and probably watch YouTube videos of people playing those games. And you can talk to people now from anywhere on earth very easily to find out what they think about it. And there are many, many more people involved with gaming of all kinds. It's not just, you know, those guys who hang around game stores. <laughs> yeah, it's a big change. It's, it's a very different environment for a game to come out in, to be perfectly honest. So, uh, yeah, we're not quite sure what the future's going to bring us, honestly. But No. So L5R has rightly been critiqued in terms of not having cultural consultants to discuss mm. terms, sometimes perpetuating certain uh, Asian stereotypes or putting on negative aspects that resound badly mm. with Asian American or, or audiences of, of different kinds because the world is complicated. Yeah. And a lot of the things that have carried over that are fundamental to L5R did carry it forward from a time when there were very, very few, if any, people, you know, there was no such thing as a cultural consultant in 1995. No. <laughs> you know, that just, that wasn't that wasn't a thing. You were, you know, lucky if you found someone who would read your game system who was from another culture. Because of how it is. It's all these little white Midwest towns. 
gaming was incredibly sexist. Yeah. Up until Vampire and Masquerade and stuff. It was just like no girls allowed signs on the door. And it was extremely difficult for that. And so when people criticize L5R for these things, they do it saying how it affects them now. And that's that's completely correct. You have to listen to them and understand them. And it's not meant as an accusation that they did something on purpose. It's more like, look, we figured this out. Since we, we have gotten better at these things. Or at least, you know, we know more about how to do it better. So now we should take these things into consideration. Yeah. And, and now we should do these things we didn't know how to do. And and to be fair, to be fair to the original people in 1995, they actually weren't trying to make a coherent anything. They weren't trying to make a coherent story. They weren't trying to make a coherent world. It was literally just snippets here and there which began to build and began to be part of their brand. Maybe if they had been thinking in those terms right back then, maybe they would have done things differently. But I, I can totally see that they were, just, were making a little card game. You know, how is this going to affect the world? And they probably weren't thinking 25 years later, we're still talking about it. Right. That said, L5R did do a really good job for its time. They did have people on their staff writing who actually knew about Edo Japan. And they worked with all the sources that were available at the time. And you can find traces of it in the game system in the first edition, even in first edition. Unlike Dungeons and Dragons, they weren't using the cheesy Hong Kong style action flicks that were on for Saturday afternoons for their inspiration. They were watching Kurosawa. They actually read the Book of Five Rings and the Hagakure and the Pillar Book of Sheishinagan and the Tale of Genji and, and like actual first person sources. Yeah. If you look at their stuff, like first edition is replete with all these quotes about from Kikita's The Sword and uh, Niten. And they worked with their own martial arts instructors who were Asian and you know, talking about Asian martial arts to try and inform that. And as I said, Risosby was the designer of the Crane Clan. She was getting her, her PhD in Edo literature while she was working on this. So it's not like they didn't use the sources that they had at the time. It's just there wasn't very much available at the time. And it wasn't like you could go and watch YouTube videos about Japanese history like you can now. They weren't even in the library, even in a university library. China had much more sources than Japan did in terms of information. Uh, I know some of this, like my husband was a religious studies mm. teacher and like there was no book on Japanese religion when he was studying this in college. Like there was a part of one book. <laughs> and his professor specialized in the subject. So, I mean, it's just, there just wasn't much. No, it was, it was a very different time. And it doesn't, it seems 1995, you think that's not that long ago, but it, no, it really is. Certainly in, in terms of the information we now have available to us. Mm -hmm. Now I can look up many things very, very easily. And if I can't, I could potentially hop online and talk to someone from Japan who studied it and... Those things just weren't possible at that point. So it's come a long way and we don't we don't know what's gonna happen. No, no, sadly. But there is some uh future for it. Yeah. As we said, the RPG is continuing with Edge Studios. The future of the LCG, we don't know what's going to happen. My personal hope is that FFG, who does some great cooperative card games decides to make a cooperative product associated with L5R and keep it going that way. That does seem like it would fit, yeah. Yeah, it would fit. And then it wouldn't have the problem that we talked about of trying to balance all these clans because, you know, yeah, it's not competitive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can look at the final LCG product, which was a multiplayer where one person plays the Shadowlands, and everyone else plays the clans. And I wonder if that's not the direction they're kind of going, to, thinking of going. But they have kept completely mum, and I have not heard anything on it. Yeah. There is a fan-created living card game product called Emerald Legacy that is coming out, and it is 
it's just kind of start starting up now, but it's going to continue the um, living card game and it's going to continue tournaments and stuff and it's going to continue having fictions. It's not official at all, <laughs> but uh, you know, it it it's for people who like playing this as a competitive game. Who, yeah, who enjoy it and want to have storyline tournaments where they can affect the future of Rokugan. And I, I have to plug it because I'm the lead writer. So um, <laughs> my first story for it has been posted out there on uh, the Emerald Legacy site. And we'll have a link for it in the show notes. And you can go read about what happens if you want to follow that storyline. You can yeah. tell me I'm, I'm a bad writer. <laughs> but, you know, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> anyway, I hope that this was an uh, interesting uh, tour down memory lane, or at least gives you some perspective as to what it comes from and what we talk about when we talk about all these different editions. Yeah. It was fun to talk about. <laughs> it was. I mean, I only came into Legend of Five Rings very, very late, like I say, very end of third edition, beginning of fourth. But it has very quickly become a very important part of my gaming environment, really. And But some of the stories are just fascinating. And there there is a lot of history there. And it, it's a lot of the the history of the game is in many ways as interesting as the history within the game, the the lore within the game. There is a movie, you can find it sometimes on YouTube, called Gamer's Hand of Fate. It's a second in a series of movies about role-playing gamers at Gen Con. And uh, it's a funny movie. But the story for that particular movie is kind of about a fictionalized version of the big tournament for L5R. I mean, it's based on L5R. Yeah. And to the point where they did have AEG design the card game that they use in the card tournament for this movie. And and a lot of L5R players were extras and stuff. If I remember right, they couldn't quite get it to work to make it actually Legend of the Five Rings. But yeah, they tried for it. Right. It, it's fa it's a fantasy, more it's conventional fantasy because yeah. they didn't want for the prop for the copyright. But the story that it's about, the real life story is about is about Legend of the Five Rings. So it's obviously an interesting enough history to actually make a movie about, <laughs> without being about what's inside the game. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you can check that out. But that's it for us this week. Thank you for listening. And we want to give a call out to Fortune and Strife, our affiliated actual play podcast. They've been on an incredibly long um, hiatus, but this week they have their first new episode in quite a, quite a while. So hopefully they'll be able to keep that up. There is an opposed library research intrigue Ooh. episode that came out. Ooh. So you can see how to do that. But it's cool things like that. That's why you would listen to uh, Fortune and Strife, I guess. Yeah. See how you would run something like that. And also call out to our friends at D20 Radio. Our content is funded by the Discord Patreon, which supports our editing costs as well as our website hosting. And you can see long-term information, articles, summaries of our podcasts, RPG tools, and more. And for our Patreons on Patreon... We have special bonus content like Adventure Seeds, early access to our adventure podcasts, and more. Online, you can find us at our website, courtgamespod.com. On Twitter, we are twitter.com slash courtgamespod. And we are on Patreon at patreon.com slash courtgames. But that's it for us this week. This is Kikita Kaori. May the fortunes favor you. And I have been Korva. And until we meet again... Keep your jade handy. <laughs>